brought to you by CGTN Europe. I'm Stephen Cole. Welcome to the Agenda podcast. COVID-19 has taken the attention away from one of the most seismic shifts in European politics in recent memory, Britain's prolonged withdrawal from the European Union. Some think the process was done and dusted on Brexit Day earlier this year, but the truth is there's still a long way to go in determining what the UK-EU relationship will look like in the future. Speaking to guests ahead of the June 30 deadline, we found out what's still at stake for Britain and Europe. Expert political scientist Sir John Curtis looks behind the politics at how the people of Britain now feel about Brexit. Uh, Sir John, it's been four years now since the uh, referendum. What are the polls showing um, about people's attitudes towards the EU now the UK has officially left? Well, the honest truth is that it doesn't look as though a great deal has changed. Um, though that said, it's not clear that necessarily that we still have a majority in favour of leaving in the way that we did in the referendum in June 2016. Uh, essentially, for much of the period up to and leading to the day in which we eventually left the European Union on January 31st this year, the polls have pretty consistently been saying that the, rather than being a small lead for leave, there was a small lead for remain. Not in truth because leave voters have particularly changed their minds. Actually, the evidence is that somewhere between 85 and 90% of both Remain and of Leave voters um, were saying, I'd vote exactly the same way again. But there was, of course, another third group, and it was the group of people who didn't vote in June 2016, some of whom were too young to vote. And certainly, if we are to believe the opinion polls, that group uh, became markedly rather more pro-Remain during the course of that uh, uh, four-year period. So if attitudes haven't changed that much towards but stay or leave, have there been any changes in attitudes towards Brexit negotiations? Well, the crucial there, of course, is uh, whether or not the United Kingdom should indeed be insisting that the talk should be all signed up and dusted in the United Kingdom finally fully leave the single market and the uh, customs union at the end of the year, end of this year which is what uh, uh, the UK has uh, had in mind or whether or not because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic it should be seeking an extension not least because certainly um, earlier this year the talks were uh, slowed up indeed halted by uh, the pandemic because both Michel Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, and David Frost, who is responsible for leading the technical side of the UK negotiations, both of whom uh, caught, or at least are thought to have caught COVID-19 and the talks had to be stopped. And in truth, they are now only going on via Zoom. They are not going to play face-to-face uh, -face in London and Brussels, and that obviously constrains them. Um, when the public are asked about this, you, it, again, it depends a bit on how you ask them. If you say explicitly to them, look, you know, coronavirus is going on, um, it slowed up the talks, you know, should we extend beyond the end of December, uh, given that fact, you tend to get majorities, in, clear majorities in favour of saying we should extend, though even then amongst leave voters quite still more people saying don't extend than we should extend and that's a crucial constituency for the uk government if you on the other hand don't mention coronavirus and simply say to people should we extend or should we get out at the end of december come what may then basically the remain leave split is, is fully replicated virtual leave voters will say no we shouldn't extend virtual remain voters will say we should and we end up with a position that's not very far from 50 50. But given that the U, this UK government, this Conservative government, is above all dependent on those people who voted Leave, it is their views that matter. But Boris Johnson uh, certainly isn't as popular as he was in December. Will that uh, have an impact on his bargaining position, his bargaining uh, abilities? 
I think all that one can say is that perhaps almost inevitably, so far as the public's confidence in the way in which the United Kingdom is approaching the Brexit negotiations is concerned, perhaps almost inevitably, some of the doubts about the competence of this government that seem to have crept into public opinion over the coronavirus uh, handling also now seems to have uh, uh, begun to affect attitudes towards how the government is handling Brexit. Now, it's still the case that this the public has more confidence in the, this government's handling of Brexit than they had in Theresa May's government, because Theresa May ended up losing the confidence of both Remain and Leave voters. But the doubts, according to the polling, are beginning to creep back in. Um, now, whether or not that makes much difference to the UK's um, uh, position in the negotiations, I'm not sure, but it certainly puts a bit more pressure on the United Kingdom government to, government to deliver. Are, are people uh, caring? Do they worry about a deal or no deal? The truth is, in most of the last four years, you know, Brexit was the top of people's concerns, and uh, many a Leave voter was willing to contemplate uh, uh, no deal, but a substantial minority were not, and most Remain voters did not want. So certainly, no deal was an important, been an important aspect uh, of the debate, uh, and part of the debate of a Brexit issue that was dominating our politics. Coronavirus knocked it off that uh, perch. Very little discussion for weeks. But uh, new polling that just come out just today uh, suggests that while it's still true that the health and the pandemic and the economy are still the principal concerns of the public, Brexit is creeping back up the level of public concern. And I think although undoubtedly quite a substantial minority of Leave voters would be happy to leave the European Union without a deal. Um, it's not, I think there's probably a, a, a non trivial minority who would not. Most Remain voters would not. And certainly, if the United Kingdom were to leave without a deal, the United Kingdom would certainly be taking quite a risk. Now, maybe in the end things will turn out fine. That's what they claim will happen. But if they don't turn out fine, then certainly the United Kingdom could well find itself, government could find itself uh, the object of quite considerable criticism. So, John Curtis, many thanks to you for joining us here on the agenda. Terry Reinke, the German MEP and founder of the EU UK Friendship Group, reflects on how the people in Brussels feel about the now inevitable split. Terry, first of all, what's your take at the moment on where we stand in the trade negotiations from the Brussels point of view? Well, I guess that uh, if you look at it from a Brussels perspective, um, it's not satisfying where we are right now. Uh, we already had very limited time now with the corona crisis. Um, time is even more uh, pressuring. Um, and we haven't seen the progress that at least we on the Brussels side wanted to see up until now. So I'm actually really worried about the cost of these negotiations. Worried about what in particular? Well, you see, from a Brussels perspective, the basis that this negotiation was starting on in this very short period was the political declaration that was agreed on with the withdrawal agreement. So, for example, the level playing field um, that we already felt was the aim that we, would, that we were trying to reach with uh, these negotiations on the future relations. And now all of these things seem to be opened up again, um, together with uh, a blocking from the British side of if there are still these kind of massive disagreements to take more time in order to look closer into the issues that are still open, where there is still disagreement. And I think that all of this together uh, makes me really worried if there is actually going to be a satisfying uh, result in the end of this year. The German government is reported to have said, get ready for a no-deal Brexit. Do you think that's pretty much the likely outcome now? Well, you see, it's June now, um, and I think uh, we should still try our best on all sides in order to avoid that, because I can only reiterate what has been said before many times. It would be a very negative outcome for both sides. But I think what is becoming more and more obvious is that from our perspective, the UK government is not ready to negotiate also on the difficult parts of a potential uh, future agreement. And, and this is why, obviously, um, they are both uh, on the side of the European Union as well as the uh, remaining member states, um, preparations going on right now, how to deal with a, with a no deal in case that this is not going to be avoidable. But again, I want to really try until the very end uh, to reach a different result because this is not in the interest of either side. Terry, do you think the atmosphere has changed since COVID-19? Before we all went into lockdown, 
there was fire and fury and brimstone from Barnier and from the UK Prime Minister about the negotiations. But suddenly, the atmosphere seems to have calmed. Or have I misread the situation? Well, I, th I think the situation is calmer, but it is still very tense. Um, and to be honest with you, I was hoping that with the situation now um, where we are all together fighting against uh, this virus, uh, we could have maybe taken a step back, looked at the situation and said, OK, maybe we will need to have a deeper look into this, which might require more time with an extension that would have been possible. Um, now, this didn't seem to be uh, the view of the UK government. I would have wished that would have been the case. Um, now we have to see in this very short period of time what can still come out of it. I can only say that I want these negotiations to be based on a fair and, um, and rational assessment of the situation and not on bad feelings on either side, because even if the UK is uh, leaving the European Union, we are still going to stay close neighbors and allies, yeah. and I think we should try our best to work together. I think everybody in the UK would echo what you're saying there. Uh, when I asked about the atmosphere changing, I also wondered about the financial uh, atmosphere, because with COVID-19, the pressure is on the EU to bail out a lot of EU members. And some are suggesting that the country that will pay that bill for Brexit, as well as the South, will be Germany. Will Germans accept that? Well, as you can see now, there is a big political majority in Germany that we will need to invest now. The extent to which and the conditionalities under which this investment will happen, uh, there is more of a disagreement. Um, but I think in, a, in an economic crisis that we will be facing, including the UK all over the world, um, we should really remind ourselves that it makes sense to work together. Uh, and this should also be the basis for the negotiations on the future relations, because we are going to have a difficult economic situation situation in the upcoming months and potentially years, and we shouldn't add a no-deal Brexit to that. And uh, also, it's reported the EU Commission, Die Welt, in fact, is reporting that the EU Commission wants Germany to pay another 42 per cent, about 14 billion euros extra, to possibly cover the loss of the UK, to cover Brexit. Uh, have you seen that figure? Is that accurate? Well, you see, in Germany, again, there is a big political majority that uh, is saying that being member of the European Union, being member of the single market, despite the fact that we uh, might might be uh, net payers into the, the budget of the European Union, is still of great economic benefit for Germany. I think the same was true for the UK, by the way. Um, but I don't want to argue about this. But under these uh, preconditions, obviously, it makes sense now for Germany to take a responsibility for the common challenge that we will be facing after this crisis. Um, and with that, I hope that we will then be building a, a recovery plan, a transition plan for our economies that will not only let us to get out of this crisis, but also to transform our economies, for example, tackling climate change and tackling social inequality that we are facing. You set up an EU-UK friendship group, didn't you, Terry, when uh, the UK decided to hold the referendum or to leave uh, the EU? Who are your members and what's the intent behind that? Well, as I said before, the UK might be leaving the European Union, but we don't want to turn our backs. And we wanted to make that clear as members of the European Parliament. Uh, and in no time, uh, really dozens and dozens of members from across the political spectrum and really also across uh, the member states of the European Union signed up for this friendship group. And we want to continue to have close relations with parliamentarians from the British side, but obviously also with civil society organizations and with citizens, because this conversation is not ending it is just beginning uh, and we want to be a platform for that and as helpful as possible in the future would that include a say uh, from uh, Britons in future EU reform <laughs> Well, you see, I already said it before, we are going to have a Future of Europe conference that is bringing together EU citizens from all across the continent to talk about the future of the European Union. And I, I think especially because of the very intense debate that the UK has seen in the past years about the European Union, it would be interesting to also have input from uh, UK citizens into that debate, uh, obviously not on a completely equal basis, but in some way to give entry points and the, the friendship group in the European Parliament will fight that this can happen. 
And it is going to happen, isn't it? Because contrary to what the politicians might be saying, and the journalists too in some cases, Germans and Bretons and French are still going to be friends in the future, even if the UK leaves the EU. Well, I can certainly assure you that the friendship group in the European Parliament is going to fight for that. Um, we have a very dark history on this continent, and I think our joint responsibility is um, that we continue to build bridges rather than have a divisive climate where we are going to blame each other. Um, and I hope that in this spirit we can build future relations that are strong and sustainable. That brings us to the end of another edition of The Agenda. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher and Spotify. You can also find us on CGTN Europe Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.